Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this workshop today. I hope you hear my voice OK. Please let me know. I can speak louder. Uh, my name is Albert. Uh, I'm an engineering manager at CodeSignal. Uh, and my main responsibility is uh, managing the team that handles the IDE. So our team is adding new features to our IDE and maintaining it, improving it to support different types of things, uh, which you will learn as we go. Uh, but I'm curious, how many of you have used code signal or code fights back then before? Cool. So that means I don't have to explain a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, but I will keep my presentation as high level as possible. We will not go too deep into the technical details so that it's accessible for bigger audience. Uh, well, what is ID? It's integrated development environment. Uh, most of you have used before for some language or for some technology. Normally, uh, they have a powerful ID that not only provides you a source code editor, but you can also debug the code, or you have some UI to build your project, run your project. Uh, and normally, historically, ideas were being developed for particular languages or particular technologies. Uh, but here are some uh, very important features of ID. It's the source code editor, where you write your code. It's the file system you, where you can have access to the project. It's a terminal where you can run the commands. Uh, and for example, debugger to debug your solution, see the variable names all the time. Um, and yeah, some of the important features are syntax highlighting, code completion, refactoring, search, and things like that. Uh, and here are some very popular ideas, like Eclipse, very popular, or PyCharm for data scientists. Uh, the ones in the um, below are normally called like source code editors, not IDEs, even though VS Code is, has so many extensions that it is considered ID in some sense, uh, because it has debugger, it has, you can install some language extension for some languages and have a great experience with it. But what are online IDs? Uh, online IDs are the ones that you access through the browser. And your project, most of the time, if it's designed correctly, uh, lives in a server on some container. Uh, so all the features that you have access are being run through that server. And in order to have, you probably have seen uh, lots of online IDs where you can just write code but you can't debug it. You don't have access through terminal to your uh, environment because desktop IDs are easy to make because they just run on your device and they run different processes, so there is nothing to worry. Whereas online IDs, you can't run C++ compiler in your browser. You need a server somewhere that will run and give you all the output. Uh, but the benefits of online IDs are first, zero setup because you just enter the link, for example, and it's already there. You don't need to set up extensions. You don't need to install different packages and stuff. It's all going to be in that container. You just enter there and start developing. Uh, and collaboration, uh, which is also essential for our case for code signal, which we'll talk about. Uh, but in case, uh, you might say like other IDs like VS Code also have plugins that you, know, you can collaborate on some projects. Uh, but let's be honest, the most comfortable one is if there is one source and you are just connected to that source and everyone can contribute to that source code. Uh, and here are some popular ideas like JS Fiddle, Code Sandbox, Code Anywhere. Uh, the most powerful one so far I have seen is Thea, uh, which they try to build the browser version of VS Code that will support like VS Code extensions and things like that. And Gitpod, for example, or GitLab, they are using Thea. And Code Anywhere uh, was having their own ID, but recently they switched completely and are using Thea ID with their, some, some of their plugins. Uh, so we, uh, 
encode signal also need a powerful ID. Uh, what we do is uh, we are a technical interview and assessment platform. So uh, if, for example, an engineer comes to a big company or small company uh, and wants to, uh, wants to get an interview, uh, one way to do it, you can say, here's a whiteboard, just write your code, which not, is not going to be good because you don't simulate the environment that they're going to work when they are at work, right? Uh, you might say, here's a Google Docs, just write your code, which is very old style. Uh, you can collaborate, but it's not an ID and it's not comfortable. So uh, as a technical interview on this assessment platform, we need to have a powerful ID. Uh, and you might say you could use some other ID that is already developed, just integrate with code signal and it would work. But we figured out that there are different things that we need that other IDs don't support, or there are different things that are critical for us that other IDs might not even care. Uh, for example, quick setup and start. When you enter a task, you don't need to wait for several minutes to have your environment. It should be quick, start your project, and start working on it. It needs to have collaboration because it's being used during interviews, so different people should be able to uh, edit the source code multiple, uh, simultaneously. Uh, it should be similar to desktop IDs. Like the most popular one is VS Code. Like more than 40% of engineers use it. And if we build an ID that is close from the experience perspective to VS Code, then people don't have to internalize the, a new ID when they interview, uh, go through an interview. And it should be lightweight. Uh, most of the browser IDs that I have seen, they are very heavy because they have lots of extensions, lots of functionality. Uh, whereas in our case, we just need to have the most important functionality and to make it as lightweight as possible. Uh, we also need like, to be able to record the entire session keystroke to keystroke so that you can later replay from some specific position and debug some specific uh, timestamp of the solution and see what was going wrong. And of course, you need to be able to run test cases and have a scoring. So that's the reason we decided that we need to build our own ID. And in order to support wide range of technologies from full stack applications to front end to database to anything, we need to be able to simulate the ID experience as good as possible so that you can interview for any project that you, that you want. Any questions so far, guys? I want to keep this as conversational as possible. Uh, if there is any question, just feel free to raise a hand. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions real time rather than leave it to the end. Cool. All right, that's, that's why we are going to focus, in general, we are going to focus how to build an online ID, but I wanted to show you like what are the challenges that we had before uh, and what are the things that we are trying to solve so that you have more context on why we do this this way. Uh, so the first thing to do is uh, to choose the, the right source code editor. So I was talking 10 minutes ago that uh, people are using different source code editors like Ace, Monaco, CodeMeter. Um, and the secret is that if you really want to have a VS Code-like ID in a, in a browser, uh, the only solution I have seen so far is to use Monaco because Monaco is the source code editor for browser that powers VS Code and all other powerful IDs that I have seen like Taya, Code Sandbox, they all use Monaco because it provides all the functionality that you might need, for example, for after completion and for other things. Whereas if you, for example, use Ace, it has a great syntax highlighting, but you have to implement all those things by yourself because it doesn't have those packages or extensions that you can plug into your ID. And CodeMirror, for example, Rappoli, Jazz Fiddle that are very popular, they use CodeMirror. Uh, but again, we were using CodeMirror back then too and we had to migrate everything from CodeMirror to Monaco because we realized that that's the only way that is state of the art right now and can provide the powerful experience. Uh, because for example, you don't have great way of handling auto completion for CodeMirror. It's designed to be just source code editor uh, but it's not designed in the core to be an ID. 
whereas Monaco is designed so that it, it is being used for VS Code, so you can even use it for browser IDs. Any comments on, I know like online IDs are debatable topics, so if there are any comments, I'm happy to hear. Uh, now it's time to figure out like, what's the architecture for a powerful ID. Uh, if you ever handle everything in client side, like there are file system, there are source code editor, and I have seen it being done a lot. We have been doing it before. So like you have just different files and you handle it all in client side in the front end. Uh, it's not going to work in the long run because eventually you are not, you are going to need different features that can, you can't run in a browser. You need a server processes to, to do that. Uh, so the architecture that we are using and some other powerful IDs are using is uh, you have some ID backend, uh, some express application, ideally written in TypeScript because um, the packages that, for example, VS Code provides, they are all written in TypeScript. So you can easily uh, import them and have even the types there. Uh, in your front end, of course, you need to have the Monaco that we were talking about. Uh, but your IDE front end should communicate with your ID backend over a WebSocket uh, entire time. So if you write something, it should notify your backend that you wrote something so that it can suggest after completion or can say like here, you have error in this line. And for any other feature like terminal, you need constantly to communicate with your backend with the WebSocket. Uh, and in the IDE backend, we normally run it in Docker container so that it's isolated environment for you. Uh, but in that container, you are going to need to start, start IDE related processes. For example, if you, are, you want to open a terminal, you are going to run Bimbush and attach it with the WebSocket to your terminal in the client side and any other feature, we will see that you just need some process, some software that you are going to run, and you are going to attach that software to your IDE backend and communicate it over a WebSocket. Yeah, essentially, uh, that's the main architecture that we need in order to have a powerful IDE. Uh, and the way you handle these Docker containers or how you manage the load balancing, those are uh, not directly related to ID, it can relate to the business. Uh, we normally have different servers, we run different Docker containers on different servers with different images depending on which technology you want to. Uh, but you can just run it on your own server and maintain the code on the server rather than connect with uh, FTP or something and edit it there. Sorry, ID related process is just a, a kind of work thread for Express App or is it uh, it can be different, that's why I try to write it in general. Like it can be a debugger process um, for, for debugging. It can be a language server for some language that you start that provides the real time after completion. So essentially the ID that you run on your desktop, it has different processes that it starts on your machine and uh, handles different functionalities. Uh, that's the same thing that you need for your browser-based ID, whereas your front end is not in the desk. Uh, in the uh, why I'm asking because Express App, like it's a, a one mm, main thread, <laughs> so I want to understand how you're uh, detaching other threads. Uh, like I don't know, so are you using any clusterization there or worker threads? Like if you're using Node.js on the backend, so I want to understand. The that's actually a great question. Uh, I feel like like most of the things are being done asynchronously, so uh, maybe there will be some. Latency, I don't know if you work with the terminal and you start a debugger simultaneously. Uh, but since most of the things are uh, running with asynchronous functionality, uh, I'm not a thread expert, so I might not be able to go deep into that. But uh, I agree with you that like uh, Express is using one thread, so it might have problems, but uh, so far, I don't know, like we didn't encounter such problem. The only thing that can happen is uh, like in, our, in a desktop ID, everything can run simultaneously with no latency. Whereas in desktop IDs, you eventually have that. But like VS Code also, I don't know, uh, it doesn't use Express, but it's also uh, written in TypeScript and probably uses one thread. But maybe I'm wrong. That can be happen. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but that's a great question. Maybe worth investigation on our team side to see like maybe it can improve the performance of the ID. Um, so let's start with uh, different functionalities that we are looking for for our ID. Uh, one of the key functionalities that you want, even if you are if you don't care about projects, you just want one single file and want to make sure that candidates have good experience in it, you need after completion. And uh, back then, the way we handled after completion, I'm talking like three years ago, we would start VS Code in some server and would take all the after complete suggestions from there. Uh, we found some, I don't know, blog from color part that they did it that way, so we thought like this is the right way. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, that area has developed in a way that for each language, the language developers also develop language servers. Those language servers are essentially, uh, like if you want your ID to not depend on the languages, you just need a unified standardized way for communicating the language uh, related things and that that is called like language server protocol. So all those languages, they have some language servers that for example, VS Code, VS Code uses under the hood to uh, run some language specific things. And for example, if you are running Java, it will use uh, the language server of Java to show you real time after completion, error highlighting. Uh, for each language, you have to set up the language server independently. So one technology might require to have C-sharp support on your device. One might just require JavaScript. But each of those things uh, have their own language servers. For example, C++ uses CLangD, and you need just to install it and start it in order to have that functionality. And in this URL, you can find lots of different language servers. But the key is that you need to communicate with a standardized approach so that it doesn't matter if it's a desktop ID, if it's an online ID, the, the language protocol is the same. Um, and that provides you, with, with a WebSocket, you can see in this GIF when I'm typing something, with a WebSocket I'm receiving different messages and those are using just on RPC uh, for, for the communication because you essentially use those language servers similar to how you would use them as classes if you were just importing them in your application because you might call a method, you get the output of that method, but it all happens with uh, just an RPC uh, using the WebSocket. And in real time, if you type something, it sends you the changes to that language server and the language server responds you with, with the suggestions or with diagnostics that you need for, for, for this playing. And on the client side, you can just uh, connect your Monaco with Monaco language client which is essentially a front-end part that handles, uh, that understands the language server protocol and can do changes in your Monaco editor accordingly. Like if it's an autocomplete suggestion, it will, you know, draw everything accordingly. But uh, this is the key. Like for example, initially we just had one ID, like one source code editor uh, and an auto completion, which is completely fine for, I don't know, algorithmic questions. If you just want someone to s write some algorithm and see if they are doing it okay. But eventually you want to simulate as much as possible the realistic environment. So that's why later you are going to need like a terminal or a project or um, running some services. Um, so the next stage is uh, to be able to support a terminal uh, if you remember, we were running everything in the same Docker container. Uh, so if you want to support a terminal in your IDE, you just need to run a terminal process in your Docker container and attach all the communication through the WebSocket to your client side. Uh, normally this visualization uh, can be handled with XtermJS. Uh, it's just for the UI, so you can write any terminal command in that XtermJS. Uh, and it will display it with the proper uh, proper uh, colors and everything. But uh, in order to have a powerful ID, that a powerful terminal that will have the same functionality as your regular desktop terminals, uh, 
the, the idea is the following. Any key press uh, should be sent to the terminal. Like if I type L, it shouldn't just write L there. It should send that I typed L to the backend. It should tell to the process that I typed L and the process, the terminal process should tell me like what should be next. It can be display L in your terminal. It can be open a Vim or something like that. Uh, so everything is just uh, what you write in your terminal. So it's just a terminal code. Uh, but essentially, uh, the key is that any key press is being sent to the backend. And all, all the things that should be written in your terminal are being handled from the backend in the terminal process. Any questions here? Yeah, one question. Uh, you say that the terminal process is in the same Docker container as the entire application. Is this the best practice? Not the application, but your ID. Yeah. So like, for example, if you are working on some project, that's your project. You can kill your container. That's up to you, right? It shouldn't affect your, for example, if, if you use it from code signal, it shouldn't make code signal go down, right? But it's your single session. We call them uh, internally persistent sessions because uh, there is a container that up and is up and running. It's yours. Like You can do whatever you want with it. Uh, and you are connected to that session in a persistent way so that you can uh, have anything you want, like terminal and other features. Uh, in general, I agree. Like It makes the things hackable. But since it's a Docker container isolated, it only can harm you. It can't harm someone else doing something because it's not their container. Um, and so what if like you lose an internet connection just for like one minute or so? Does it break something? Uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, well, uh, it will reconnect through WebSocket. So uh, you might be able to type in the ID because it's not, you know, you might not have after completion, but you might be able to type. You will not be able to type in the terminal because the terminal process should know what you are typing, right? And the things that you might also need for, for the server, like load this directory. Like since we don't keep it all in client side, you might need a connection for that. But as soon as your connection is back, it will reconnect. And even in, in case of collaboration, it will add you all the, all the missing co code that someone wrote. And it will also send all the code that you have wrote. Uh, and I will tell more about how we handle the collaboration. <laughs> uh, but in general, uh, yeah, like you will be able to write code, but you will not be able to kind of do anything to your server. All right, uh, supporting big projects. Um, so in order to support big projects, and you, some of you might use code sandbox, and you probably have noticed that it is mostly front end based applications. Like you might not have node modules there, most of the cases. Uh, some of the things are being rendered automatically because they have lots of custom logic in there. And the reason I know that uh, when we were building our ID, we investigated all the popular IDs in the market uh, to figure out what's, what are they doing right, what are they doing wrong, uh, so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. Uh, and essentially, if you really want to support big projects, you can't handle your file system in your client side. You can't have all the, sort, all the code in the client side because uh, you're just, for example, node modules is very big. You have to constantly make a request like, give me the list of the directories in node modules and get it from the server rather than keeping it entirely in the client side all the time. And you can see like every, everything I do it sends some WebSocket messages to the server, like opening a directory, editing a file, and things like that. Even if I open this file, I don't know what's the state of that file right now in client side, because maybe someone edited it from the terminal. So I need to make a request to get the state of, the, of that file. Uh, but if I make changes, I need to push also those changes back to the server so that others will also know that some changes happened to this file. And yeah, like uh, this should be handled with a virtualized list because it can be a very big list and you can't render all of them. But it, it can depend on the 
platform. So for example, we use React. So we used React virtualized to render big uh, projects, but it can be different for different cases. All right, live collaboration. I know this is an extensive topic and I only just have one slide for this, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. But essentially, uh, what is live collaboration? Uh, you need to be able to edit the code real time and uh, other collaborators should see your changes. And sometimes the changes can be conflicting and you need to make sure that it doesn't break the ID. So everyone should see the same thing all the time and it should be consistent with what you have in the server. Uh, there is a way for doing it called operational transformation. And although there are different approaches for that, and I can tell you like how we were handling it before and how we are handling it right now and what's the difference. Uh, but essentially, uh, each of the things that you do, like code change, code selections, those are operations. And imagine like multiple people making operations from different sites. You need to be able to keep revisions in each site and you need to be able to transform one operation after another so that if you apply this transferred operation, it's the same as applying this operation, then this operation. But if you apply the, same, the two operations simultaneously, it would break. Uh, so normally, uh, what this operational transformation does, it has some consistent way of defining operations. It has a way to merge operations. And when you do changes here and your internet connection loses, you keep all the, those operations and later when your, your connection comes back, you synchronize it with the server. So you send your operations, you get back what operations happen there and you essentially transform those operations both in the client side and in the server side. Uh, and for each file, we keep a separate state and a list of operations in the backend uh, because each file, like the, the, the main challenge in collaboration is text collaboration. Like if, for example, I create a new file here, it will be displayed for everyone that I created this file. There is no need to like handle things simultaneously. Whereas in case of text collaboration, two things can conflict and we need to be able to transform two conflicting things. Um, and you need to also be sure that if someone changes something from the terminal, it also is being handled with those operations. Otherwise, it might desynchronize everything. And that's what I ha have seen in other platforms. So for example, uh, when we are experimenting with code sandbox, we noticed that it is easily, you can easily break the collaboration logic if you mix a couple of things together, like the terminal, the files and stuff. And that was one of our goals to make sure that uh, no matter what you do, no matter how bad things go, no matter how long you don't have an internet connection, you can always synchronize back and everyone will see the same uh, results. Uh, you can also open this visualization tool. Maybe we'll do it at the end if we have time. It shows you how different operations are being applied so that it's more uh, easy to understand uh, what's going on there because, uh, but essentially the way we keep all those operations, you keep, uh, for example, uh, you need to be a make sure that it's flexible so that if someone did several changes simultaneously, so for example, refactor this name to this other name, those are changes in multiple positions. So you need to be able to handle those multiple positions simultaneously. Uh, so the, the way our operational transformations work, it's uh, an array of things. Uh, if it's a positive number, it means uh, skip n characters in the code because you can assume that this is just one string rather than rows and columns. If it's a delete operation, you assume it's a negative number. And if it's a adding some code, then it's a string. So those three components um, in, a, uh, in, in an array format can provide you any transformation in your code editor. And the good thing about these operations is you can merge any two operations together. Like you can say that if you apply this operation and this operation, then I can say one operation that does both together. Uh, and that's crucial to keep one operation in the client side when you edit your code multiple times so that you can later 
transform these operations with other operations without keeping the entire list of operations. But for example, initially what we had before, we would just keep, for example, a range that you modified and what you modified. Uh, but the problem with that, you will not notice it in practice most of the time, but if your internet connection is low, sometimes people will make changes that are a little bit non-standard, and you might not be able to merge several operations together. Uh, so far, this, this approach is the one that works best in practice. Sorry, how it solves uh, the clock synchronization problem? Or does it solve the Which one? Clock syn synchronization problem. Um, do you mean like... Uh, like the sequence of the uh, events that are happening. Uh -huh. uh, it may um, differ uh, how your network is going right now. So, mm -hmm. for example, like either um, change the first, change the function name. Another one, other participant, like edit the name, just mm -hmm. change one letter. But uh, my first change that should be uh, done first, it wasn't because of some network issue or, or uh, some clone, mm -hmm. uh, clock syn synchronization problems. And um, your change is applied first, and then mm -hmm. I just rewrite everything. And the thing is that uh, you can't, like when, when thinking about collaboration, you ta can't take into account what people intended. You just need to think about it like a row uh, operations on text. So one operation is in some revision of your code, some operation, and another operation is on another revision, some operation. And you need to make sure that you can combine those operations in the same revision. Depending on which one receives first, that might be applied first. So you might say that I was intended to do this, but so someone else was intended to do this. And intention, like naturally, this should be first, then this. Uh, but when building uh, collaboration, you can't assume that it's going to understand the context. It's going to just have revisions for each file. And it's going to have uh, operations that increase this revision as you apply them. Uh, we can, for example, open this visualization tool um, to see like how, how it happens. For example, if I change this one to delete, it's, it's sending the request that it's deleted. And imagine I, I don't know, add some A here. So uh, even though in this case, uh, like, I don't know, do you think like depending on which operations I do first, the result will be different? Yeah, so um, one of the approaches that I know that people send timestamps, but it's not so uh, uh, that, that I call like clock syn synchronization problem. But for example, it can be corrupted on a user browser. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I just want to know if it's rational, this approach has it in mind or has some ways to activate it. Mm -hmm. We don't keep time steps. Uh, so the server is always the source of truth. Depending on which order it applies to them, in that order it broadcasts to other collaborators. And that's the revision that we take into account when we are updating in our client side revisions. Because like server has some revision and each of the clients have different revisions. But the source of truth is here. So depending on which one comes to the server first, that revision is being applied. But for example, the server might be in this revision and some operation comes to this way. You should transform this operation through the other operations that happened after it to apply new operations that you can later apply to the other clients uh, so that all of them have the same order of revisions rather than, you know, conflict. So I can imagine a case then well, I delete the function completely mm -hmm. and you edited uh, one row uh, in that function. Mm -hmm. So when the new change applies, you already don't have a function there. What happens in that case? That's exactly this case. Like I deleted this name and I added this letter. Let's see what happens. So we can, uh, you know, like in, in each stage, you can see like which revision is this, this. So this one is applied on revision zero because it was in the initial revision. And this was also applied on revision zero. So assume that this one deleted first. Now it has revision. Uh, after this, it will have um, on revision one. So if I apply this change after that, Uh, now this change is being 
applied to revision one rather than revision zero. So we transform this operation, and I believe um, uh, so this operation should be transformed so that it also takes into account that these operations happened after on, on revision zero and your operation also happened on revision zero. So that after that, when you apply the changes, uh, all of our intentions happened. Like I wanted to delete that portion of code, it was deleted. You wanted to add this letter, it was deleted. Yeah, the state, may be corrupted. The state uh, I mean intuitive state might be corrupted. But the most important thing is you didn't lose my changes. I didn't lose your changes. So if I wanted to add something, I added. If you wanted to delete something, you deleted. And we all ended up with the same uh, thing. But yes, I agree. Like If it was a function, I added one line, and you deleted it, the logic might break. But in terms of code that we both see, it will not break. Uh, because text collaboration uh, is not only for the code. It also can be, for, for example, for rich text like Google Docs, and in those cases, again, like they need some way to handle uh, all the conflicting operations. But the main goal is to make sure that each of us will see the same thing and no information will be lost. Do you allow users, like in merge commits, like uh, choose what kind of, uh, so for example, you made some uh, change mm -hmm. and uh, you say that the code has already changed, mm -hmm. and uh, you may not want to apply your change? Yeah. Well, since it's a real-time collaboration, uh, you don't need to handle like conflicts. It's being handled automatically. Uh, but I agree, like you can't do it on production code because maybe someone comes and changes something, and you wanted to change something else, and it might break uh, at that point. But uh, yeah, we we don't. Uh, it should be in real time. You can't, you know, handle the conflicts all the time during an interview. Uh, but yeah, this, this was the essential thing to make sure that no information is being lost. So as long as we can keep that, it doesn't matter if the intuition for every person was, was met because... Uh, that's a great question. Uh, normally, the challenging part is to handle on the stack for each of the collaborators individu individually. Uh, we you know, researched some papers and figured out that no matter how we do it, it is going to break eventually. So we decided that in terms of collaboration, let's just assume that everyone has the same undo stack so that those undo operations are just another operations that you can apply. And those operations can also be transformed through other operations. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, in the ideal world, you want to be able to handle also different on those tags individually. But no matter how, how hard you try, it always doesn't get good. And there is no one approach that really works and people can apply it. There's tons of research on that, but no one uh, approach that works the best way. I know like in Google Docs, for example, the undo works differently for different people. Uh, but it's, it's designed to be edited by different people in different times, whereas during interviews, you just enter an interview with the collaborator. And it doesn't really matter if the understanding is yours or if it's shared between you. Does it make sense? Right, any other questions about the collaboration? I felt like one slide is probably not enough for that, but I didn't want to go too technical about it um, to make sure uh, it doesn't get boring for most of the people. Uh, all right, similar to other features, for example, how would, would you handle the search? When you do a undo, uh, do you accumulate the history, or do you go back to history? Do you do it? What? Do you add uh, history checkpoint every time you do some undo operations? So basically, is undo operation just an operation, or is it 
something like going back? Uh, well, you, for example, you, you imagine that you just have one undo stack, right? In your client side, it's just yours. So even if someone else did some changes, it's still some changes, right? So you keep all of those operations in your undo stack so that if you undo something, it's just taking these operations and undoing it. Um, so it, it just keeps like Monaco events in a in a undo stack the same way. Like the same way you would have just one Monaco and work on it and do undo request. It's just similar because we apply those operations on Monaco. You, you store it in client side. Uh, we also stored all the operations in the server side just to be able to synchronize everything. Uh, but yeah, like you, you do have on the stack that stores all the, you know, it's, it's being handled in Monaco. Uh, so essentially it just stores every operation. Okay, the, uh, consider you done something and some merge conflict happened and uh, your code decided to solve it in certain ways. But it was not the best way. After that, can your user undo it? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, like, you can essentially... That's because uh, I was using Cloud9 uh, previously, like, it was two or three years ago, and it happened to me. We were collaborating, and after that, and I wrote some line of code, and my code mm -hmm. was erased, and there was no way Going back, like undoing it. So we just. Oh, I see. So, like, like if you are there, you are doing something and someone deletes it, you can always undo it because it's still another operation. If you leave your desk, like close your tab and come back and want to, you know, undo it, uh, we are just going to undo starting from the point that you started. Uh, we don't keep this, all the. Uh, undo history in the server. Uh, so in that case, you will not be able to undo. But if you were there and someone changes something and you want to undo their changes, that will work. And that's the advantage, I guess. Like, uh, if we had different undo stacks, then some, if someone changed it and I wouldn't be able to undo their changes, then it would break something. Whereas if the undo stack is shared, you just undo all the operations that happened on your side, right? So in some sense, it's a feature. In some sense, it's a missing feature. So <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, uh, similar to all the other features, and I guess I should hurry, uh, the way you would handle searching files or searching content in a file is the same. Uh, if you had everything in your file system in your client side, then you would have to write your custom logic for it. Whereas if you are handling everything on your server side, there is a VS Code package, you can see it here, that works exactly the same way as VS Code search works. So all you had to do is to apply that command, get the results, and populate those results back and show it uh, in a nice way. Uh, and essentially, it shows all the same information like VS Code would show. Uh, and you don't have to go and implement your custom search logic for that. Um, and of course, the debugger, similar to the after completion, it should be communicating all the time with your uh, server. And depending on what action you make, it should send back to your server. And depending on what, what are the variable names, that process that you start in the backend, that debugger, it should provide you uh, using the VS Code debugger protocol, I guess, in the format that will have the call stack, the variable names, the names for the watches, uh, and all that information that you are going to display. Um. Hmm? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. So, uh, like the way we build it, we try to separate the visualization from the core logic. So imagine building a, an API for IDE that you say, do this, do that, instead of visualizing it. Uh, but when it comes to visualization, 
all of those are just some events like clicking this button that should be handled uh, by the class API that you provide for the ID. So we try to uh, separate those. So for example, we are using React now. Maybe in the future we try to use something else. But the core ID logic shouldn't change because of that. So the API you provide for communication and the visualization you provide shouldn't be super connected. Does it make sense? Other questions? Uh, all right, and the last thing we really need uh, for an assessment tool or for an inter interviewing tool is to record everything, all your keystrokes, so that we can fork at every stage and see the result uh, of that stage. And uh, the way we do it, you just have recording servers and they connect with the WebSocket as a separate collaborator. And since each of the collaborators get all the information, the code changes, code selection, terminal elections, you just record those and then replay in your same ID without creating any session, without creating any Docker container. Uh, you just keep all those events and uh, replay it uh, so that you can even you know, fork some of the stages and work on it in a single session. And yeah, uh, in order to optimize it, you need to, you, you need to be able to fast forward on your recording and to do that, you need to keep the entire state of your project in every x events. So like it can be 500, it can be something else. So that if you fast forward here, it will find the first state and apply the other events on top of that state. Well, I guess that's all I wanted to share, uh, like the best practices for creating uh, online ID. Any questions that comes on top of mind? Yeah, I have two more questions. Mm -hmm. The first one, um, uh, like when I was using any online um, editor, like not only for interviews, but for also development, so I always had rendering problems. So how you're solving these rendering problems? Um, um, I know that in backend you keep uh, the state in memory, right? So to make it faster. So I, I like to understand uh, how you went, for example, WebSocket gives some new events, how uh, you're uh, re-rendering the page, and how you're applying all the changes in front of um, That's a good question. Let me actually do some demo, I guess. Uh, all right, let's just open the inspect here. So essentially, if you reconnect with your WebSocket, you need to keep, you need to get the state of the IDE. Uh, whereas if your connection is always up and running, there shouldn't be any issues because you are getting all the events all the time. Um, the internet is a little bit slow, but let's bear with it. Yeah, like essentially every, browser ID, if it's very powerful, it's not very lightweight because you need like X term, you need uh, different language uh, syntax highlightings. And in general, in our ID, uh, we combined the highlighting of ACE editor because Monaco highlighting, syntax highlighting wasn't that great. So it made our ID a little bit bigger. And yeah, like it can be, I don't know, 600 kilobytes for just the ID component. Um, but I don't know. I, I agree that it can be, it can have a little bit latency. But if I open the network here, and here I'm just a candidate. Wait. So you can see that all those messages come from just my npm install because all of those are just terminal messages. So it tells me like uh, how things are changing. Uh, but uh, the problem with, with these online IDs are like if you do different things simultaneously, like it's going to, you know, you might have to wait like a second to open a page because like all of this is being done synchronously. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, 
the pr pr comfort it provides that you can just open someone else's project and do changes in it instead of setting up on your local machine, uh, especially during interviews where you d don't have time. You just need to st start and work on a project. Uh, it's, it's a trade-off that you uh, need to take, but uh, it's not going to work as fast as a, I don't know, desktop ID for sure, because all of the things are going to happen with the WebSocket. But essentially, it can get uh, as powerful as a normal uh, uh, desktop ID. And especially during interviews, you want to make sure, for example, you have a rendering of your application. And it should be fully functional application, not just one page. You need to be able to handle different URLs here. Um, I don't know. But any other questions? Did I answer your question, though? Kind of, yeah. I say that it's hard. <laughs> if you have to deal with uh, ensuring the security for both parties for the interview, uh, like that, that's a parties, good question. That steal information from the other party. Yeah, those, those are should be done in Unix level, like on your container, because a candidate might not have access to some files, a client might no, Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it uses uh, a token for, for, for the connection and stuff. Uh, so if it's not authorized by code signal, you will not be able to access to it. Uh, but when it comes to the browser, it's just random URL, so it's less likely that someone will be able to guess it if, you, if we talk about this one, the subdomains. But yeah, essentially here you can also apply some, I don't know, uh, different security measures to make sure that no one has access to it. But essentially it's just an application of someone that is doing some interview. So it's not super private if the information. It's not like someone else's, uh, I don't know, work or startup that you are messing with. But I feel like we don't have uh, a lot of time uh, I want to add two things. Uh, I want to make you know, gifts to people that contributed a lot to this session. And also, we have cookies here. Um, the goal of these cookies is uh, to provide us some feedback if you used code signal before, of, or if you didn't use it. You just scan it, um, eat the cookie, and pass a survey. So feel free to take those. Uh, and I want to give those books to some of the people that were very active here. Mm -hmm. One is you. Thank you very much for your time. One is you guys. You can read it together. <laughs> and one to the person who had questions but is not, you know, 